Now, if you've been a friend of this radio station for a long time, there's a name that's real familiar in Northeast Ohio, particularly in the city of Cleveland, is Pastor Joe Abraham. He's just a legend. He's been uh, doing Pause for Prayer here at Moody Radio for decades, and he's just been a faithful friend of this show, a quiet encourager uh, to us. He's joined us a number of times on the program, but I can't tell you how much he's meant to me personally. I, I remember getting a tour of the city from him. He drove us around showing us about churches making a difference for the kingdom and where his church was fantastic. You know Joe real well, Mike, don't you? Well, I wouldn't say know him well, but I do, do know him um, better and um, have the pleasure of getting to know him better uh, through recording his pause for prayer. Uh, Pastor Joe also helps out during share. Uh, yep. he, can, he can sing. Double your pleasure, double your fun <laughs> with double mint, double mint, double mint gum. I forgot about that. <laughs> I, I bet he wishes he didn't do that. Yeah, I bet he did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, and so Pastor Joe retired a number of years ago as senior pastor of Scranton Road Bible Church um, after many decades. He's still hanging out doing great stuff there. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know why it's taking us so long, but in studio with me right now and on the live stream is the new senior pastor, new as in, it's been a couple years. <laughs> his his name is Pastor Mark Pratt, senior pastor of Scranton Road Bible Church. Welcome to the studio, my friend. Thank you. The crowd loves you. <laughs> we'll get your mic up and rolling here. We should be good now. All right, good. That, uh, yeah. Okay. Now we, now we should be good. <laughs> there it is. All, the all right, I hear myself now, yeah. Yeah, and you sound great. Yeah, no. <laughs> so now you, as I understand it, you were telling me before, you're, you're a farm kid. And a, a lot of people would appreciate that listening to this program. We got a lot of farmers who listen while they're milking the cows or getting the tractor ready and such. You grew up on a cattle farm. Yes, yes. In where was it again? In southwestern Virginia. So we grew up on a beef cattle farm. And uh, we had sheep when I was a little kid, but the price for sheep wasn't as good as the price for cattle, beef cattle. And so I think we ditched the sheep in 86 so and what? just solely focused on cattle what was your chore uh so i just did normal chores like everybody else around the house and okay so you um, weren't out there milking or no we, so we didn't shoveling. milk so but i would help oh, feed right. in the winter and things like that yeah help with hay and i'm such a novice you yeah. said beef cattle and i'm like <laughs> you didn't say dairy cattle wow no I'm those guys woke up early to milk the cattle i had a friend who was on a dairy cow farm and he would he'd be up at two three in the morning doing stuff so so you were just ra raising them for food and yes. making sure they're fed and everything. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And how did you end up in Ohio? Uh, so <laughs> that's a long story. And uh, so I'm a change of career pastor. I, uh, I, I grew up in southwestern Virginia. I grew up in a Presbyterian church there, a really good church, and um, came to Christ in my teenage years, but kind of in my high school years. Uh, I wasn't a good student. And uh, as a kid, I'd been talking to my mom. She's would ask me what I'd want to do as an adult. And I, I was always fascinated by, we, you know, everybody was a small country church, so we didn't have a kids programming. Everybody sat in the, in the uh, sanctuary during the service. And, um, and I was always fascinated by the, the sermons and specifically just w when we'd go through really interesting stories within the scriptures. And, um, and so I, I remember my mom asking me like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I'm like, well, I thought about being a pastor like, what do you have to do to, to be a pastor? And my mom's like, well, I'm not sure, but I know it's a lot of school. And as soon as she said <laughs> that, my brain was like, all right, that's not for me. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. And I wasn't, I wasn't a very good student. Um, and so uh, my junior year of high school, I was walking down the hallway and there was a Marine Corps recruiter standing in the hallway. And he said, Hey, young man, he's like, you look like you'd be perfect for the Marine Corps. And I'm like, Oh, really? <laughs> and, uh, and so I knew that I wasn't ready for school and, uh, really liked the, the, the Marine Corps. And so I, I joined the Marine Corps and went into the military for four years. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in terms of, uh, growing up, but it also taught me that I was, I actually was a good student. I just wasn't disciplined. Interesting. And so, and when you have to learn things very quickly and you're forced to study, I'm like, oh, I can remember information I can learn. And, um, and so just through the course of four years, I knew that I wasn't going to be a career military person, but I, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I, I was a uh, crew chief on helicopters, CH-53 helicopters. Whoa. And so I'm like, well, maybe it's flying. I want to do flying. So I got, when I got out, I went to this college, my, uh, my first year, my major was aviation, criminal justice. And I was like, maybe I can fly for like the DEA or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and I really didn't like flying that much in terms of like. I don't want to do this for a career. And so I'm like, I dropped that, became a criminal justice major and uh, became a police officer. 
And at the time, I wasn't like seriously trying to follow Jesus. I was just, uh, you know, I believed, but I wasn't like uh, serious about my faith. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to take like a New Testament studies class in the college that I was at. It was we had to take religion cl credits, and I read through the Gospels uh, my my freshman year, and I'm like, for the first time, like they really hit me hard, and and we had to write a paper on you know what are some of the core themes or elements of Jesus. And uh, it just like floored me. And at the same time, I met my wife who was beginning to um, really be serious about following Jesus. And through the course of, of finishing up school and getting married and being hired by the state police, uh, things began to shift in my, just my thinking about the world and my heart. And uh, I, I remember being in the police academy, Virginia State Police Academy, it's live-in academy. There's eight and a half months where you, you live there during the week. Wow. And this guy that sat beside me, huge, like just massive dude. And uh, he's like, I, I could hear him talking to himself like, okay, you can do this. You can do this. And I'm like, what is this? What is, what can he do? <laughs> like he's starting to scare me a little bit. And I didn't know these guys that well at the point. And like one of our breaks during the day, he stands up and he goes, he's like, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to start a Bible study on Wednesday nights. Anybody else want to come and join me? And I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, that's crazy. Like what's, <laughs> what is he? He's like, cause it was, it was really, you know, structured. Like you didn't just stand up and say things. And, uh, because it was kind of, it wasn't like a, a boot camp, but they were very like, some of those are real close to boot camp. Yeah. You've been through so, Marine boot camp. Yeah. It wasn't, so it wasn't say, close to not. Marine boot camp, but, uh, if it was, I went, <laughs> I'd say it's boot camp. Yeah. And some of the, some of the guys that were there had not done any kind of, uh, military were, were pretty, uh, overwhelmed by it. And so he stood up and did that. I'm like, what is this guy doing? Like the instructors are going to come in and they're going to, and he's like, well, who wants to join it? And there was like a couple of hands and I'm like, man, this is crazy. And as I'm thinking that my hand goes up and I'm like, what? So he started this Bible study and there was a bunch like 10, 15 of us in this class of 70 uh, that would just meet on Wednesdays. And, um, he was, he was from a completely tradition, different tradition than me. And like he would get preaching and it was like, Man, this is great, and and just a couple things happened in that class. My relationship with those guys grew really tight, and I, I just began to see the the implications of my faith for the job that I was getting ready to start doing. Wow! And it was it was it was massive. And then, interestingly enough, like most of us that were in that class in Virginia, the state police they put you in different areas where they need uh, people, and it's usually the areas that are the least popular because. Uh, all the people who have seniority move to different regions of the state. And um, and so we had choices to go to like three different major metropolitan areas. And uh, one of those was the D.C. Much metropolitan area. It was crazy there. Nobody liked working there. So all the new guys got put there. And there was like eight guys in that study that went to the same area. And we ended up working the same shift together. And um, And so we were constantly working as police officers, but also like really talking about how like, how does our faith intersect with what we're doing? Wow. And um, my best friend at the time, he was on the shift with me all the time. And we just, we grew close and we would talk about it constantly. But um, how that relates to where I am now is um, he, so he had not been baptized. I had not ever been baptized. And he was like, he was terrified of water. He almost got kicked out of the academy because he wouldn't get in the water. And we had to pass like a swim test. And uh, he had like a water phobia. And so he's he's like, I'm going to get baptized. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but it'd be easier if you did it too, which kind of broke the dam for me in terms of I'd been very pridefully withholding, like being all in for Jesus. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I, I believe that's good enough. But when he said that, it kind of broke some things free for me. So we got baptized on the same day and he started talking about, hey, I want to become a missionary. And I'm like, dude, we're just, we just starting our career as, as police officers. Why do you want to do that? And he's like, I just feel like the Lord is really moving me to do that. And so we were talking about that a lot. And, um, uh, in 2006, he was, he was shot and killed in the line of duty. Oh no. And, um, I'm so sorry. There's a lot of things. I mean, it's been a long time, but there was a lot of things that happened in the context of that. I remember that day cause I was, I had just gotten onto our SWAT team and I was asleep and our pager went off and the pager went off and it was kind of, there was three tones for the pager. There was like uh, it's kind of not an emergency, emergency, and then like super emergency. And that's the page, that's the tone that went off. And I'm like, okay, what's happening? And so I called in and our dispatcher, I could just tell she'd been crying and she was very good friends with him. 
And I'm like, what's going on? Like, why are they, you know, why are they activating us? And um, she's like, you don't want to know. And I'd already tried calling him because I knew he had been working that day. And uh, he was supposed to come over to the house that night for dinner. And I was calling him to say, hey, uh, depending on what's going on, you may not be able to come over to the house for dinner tonight. And his his phone, he just didn't answer. And so I'm like, okay, so maybe he's working this 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 thing that's happening. And when she said, you don't want to know, I'm like, I knew exactly what. And I'm like, just tell me. And she just broke out crying, and she told me. And he was being life-flighted um, to uh, the hospital, Inova, Fairfax, to – um, he was still alive at the time, and we were the the initial report was a sniper in the woods had shot him, oh. and um, and so we were being tasked with trying to find the sniper that was there, and um, the uh, the rage that I felt was just you know, like overwhelming, and um, I knew that if if they took if they knew how how I felt, then they would take me off the team, and so I was kind of like playing it cool. I wanted to be on the team that found the guy that shot my buddy. And um, and it ended up being uh, a, an, an accidental uh, discharge of a rifle in the back of a truck oh. that um, a, 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 another trooper had pulled over a drunk driver. They'd, they'd actually wrecked and was working the accident, and he'd gone to help. And when they flipped the truck back over, there was a rifle in the back that they had not seen. And it fell. And when it fell, there was a round in the chamber, and it shot him. It went into his armpit. And, wow. And so, uh, but I still harbor, like, a real anger for him and uh, really a hatred. And so in the in the days, his family asked me to do part of the eulogy. With us in studio, uh, an incredible story in the life of Pastor Mark Pratt. He's senior pastor of Scranton Road Bible Church, where uh, Pastor Joe Abraham was for so many years. You know his voice from— Pause for prayer. We're having a great time hearing his story. I'd highly encourage you to uh, go find our live stream if you haven't yet. Text LIVE to 440-546-2255 because there's so much more to talk about with Pastor. There's not a ton of time left. So we'll continue this conversation here, but we'll keep going on the live stream, right, Daria? Yep. So uh, you can go find that live stream. We can hear more of his story there, okay? Yeah. Uh, but for now, uh, you were before the break talking about your race on a farm. Um, you joined the military. What a story become a Marine, uh, leave that, go into law enforcement, really are getting serious about your faith uh, as a, a state trooper yep. in Virginia, and tragically, in a horrific accident, mm -hmm. I mean, something that you can't even calculate the odds of this thing, yep. your closest friend who loved Jesus and was yeah. really your your best friend yeah. is, is shot in the line of duty. Yeah. Uh, and that leaves you angry. Yeah. You were so mad and wanted to find the guy, but yeah. it wasn't, there wasn't a guy to find. So what, right. what did that do to you? So, so there was a just a real darkness that settled into my heart, especially as I was preparing this eulogy, and I didn't want to write it. I was like, I don't, I like, I know what Jesus tells me to do in, in loving my enemies in Matthew five. Like, I know that stuff, but I don't want to listen to it. Right. And so, for the first time, I'm wrestling with that kind of thing, where Jesus is clearly calling me to do something that I didn't want to do, and yet I knew that that's what I had to do. And just through the process of that, with uh, in conversations with our church because he and I went to the same church. They had actually the elders of that church had gone to the hospital to pray before he had landed before he died and 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 so there was a there was a close connection in the church and just the Holy Spirit just working in my life as I'm as I'm writing and and processing this and so um it was a it was a long process of of forgiveness and healing and yeah. and loving my enemy. I wasn't like instantly it happened, but the Lord helped carry me through that and for the first time I. I experienced what it was like to really study his word deeply and to let it start shaping me in a way that wasn't just surface level. And and I was doing it as I was writing this speech that I was going to give at his funeral. And so I I, I I basically wanted to share like like he was a he was brave, he was a great man, but he was a great man of God primarily. And that's what made him a great man. And so when I when I preached that at his funeral, the chaplain of the state police came up. And he said, "Have you ever thought about preaching?" <laughs> and that was kind of a spark for me. And there's a lot of things that happened in that year um, that sparked that. And finally, I went to my wife one day, and I'm like, "Hey, this is what I'm struggling with. I think that the Lord's calling me into ministry, and that means leaving what we have here and going to school." And my wife's like, instead of looking at me like I was crazy, she said, "Well, let me pray about it." And wow. she prayed, and then she said, "Yeah, let's do it." And it's like, boom. And then was that like, shocking. 
uh, I was kind of hoping she wouldn't say let's do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'd have an excuse, but she's um, she's an amazing woman. So she was like, yeah, let's do it. And um, and it was kind of a crazy adventure. And so we felt that God had prepared us for urban ministry. Mm-hmm. So we went to seminary, finished seminary, came to Cleveland and started to try to plant a church that failed. And we knew like we needed to be in a church. And we had always, whenever I was off from the church we were planting, we would go to Scranton. And uh, we had great relationships there. And so we knew like if we weren't planting a church, that's the church we would be at. And uh, so we shut down the church over the course of a month. And after our last um, kind of meeting as a church, the very next Sunday we were at Scranton. And um, just through my relationship with Pastor Joe, who is, you guys know, he's he's an amazing. He's amazing. He's an amazing pastor and uh, a man of God. And um, transitions can be hard in churches. And um, it's we, he and I were talking yesterday and we're like, because we were talking about some churches that we we're praying for. And we're like, you know, by the grace of God, we've not had. Uh, the kind of difficulties that other churches go through in the transition. So, Well, and we're going to put a uh, punctuation mark there. It's a comma, actually, because we're going to continue this discussion on our live stream. Give me 20 seconds to reset. We'll be right back on YouTube. Yeah, so uh, go find. if you haven't found us, just search on YouTube. Uh, we're, we're called Mornings with Brian on Moody Radio Cleveland. You can also text live to 440-546-2255. We'll continue this discussion with Pastor Mark Pratt, Senior Pastor of Scranton Road Bible Church, if folks can't join us in the live stream and want to learn more about the church, how do they find out? Uh, ScrantonRoad.org. ScrantonRoad.org. Go to ScrantonRoad.org. <laughs> and we'll continue this discussion on YouTube here in just a couple minutes. Hey, everybody. Uh, first time we're doing this, super excited uh, that we can give it a try. But we're continuing the show offline now that J.D. Greer started on WCRF. In the live stream here, we're continuing. You can see him with me, Pastor Mark Pratt. Uh, he's been telling his story this morning about God's... The only story God could write. Yes. yes. About a journey he took you on from yeah. rural Virginia on a farm. Yeah. Raising beef cattle. Yep. All the way through to the Marines, to yeah. a state trooper in Virginia, yeah. now here to Cleveland. So you you tried to plant a church and that failed. Oh, yeah. Most people would give up at that point. Yeah. Uh, you're going to Scranton. Yep. Uh, Pastor Joe, you figured out pretty quickly. He's a legend. Yes. Oh, yeah. Nobody wants to follow right. a legend. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so how, how did that... <laughs> How did that come about that you would have the opportunity to do it? Yeah, just so attending. It, it's crazy. So we the church plant shut down. I'm I had been working by vocationally. So part of the reason I was really burned out. And so I just kind of pushed into my bi vocational job, which was a, a secular job and um and was working in the neighborhood and just attending Scranton and just really had told him had met with Pastor Joe and, and some of the other uh, pastors on staff and said, Hey, we don't want to just sit in the congregation and not do anything, but we really need a season where we're not like doing stuff. Yeah. And, and Pastor Joe was like, yeah, do what you need to do. And so we just, for a season, we were just, we would go on Sunday morning and, um, and then that was it. And then we would take our kids to the good news kids program, which is the midweek like kids programming. And, but that was it. And then, um, over the course of several months, I began to feel, you know, better <laughs> I wasn't as burned out and um, I had preached a couple times as a guest preacher for some of their special sort of like Good Friday services and things like that just because someone has to do it yeah and, and, and they knew <laughs> and they and so uh, we we work with ambassador soccer for a soccer camp so they do a gospel presentation and I'd done that and I'd preached at some special services and um, and so they knew that uh, the the social pastor at the time Che Kim had asked if I would begin to think about helping with the teens doing some teen church stuff and but we weren't members and you have to be a member to 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 teach there and so um so i was like okay well let's just let's go through member we don't know where where the lord's taking us next um i hadn't even began looking at other ministry opportunities at that point um and so we were like well let's no matter what let's just let's become members if it's six months if it's eight months we'll be members here until the lord calls us somewhere else because we knew we weren't done with ministry we just didn't know where it would take us. And we, we felt like if it took us out of Cleveland, we wanted to be closer to families, to our family in Virginia and Indianapolis, one of those two places. So we went through the membership class, became members, and um, and I kept waiting to jump into the rotation for teaching with teens, teen church. At the same time, I began to say, okay, it's time to, to be looking at ministries, looking for ministries. So I began to send out resumes to churches all over the place. There wasn't anything in Cleveland that I, that I felt was right. And so... 
Um, we sent I, Tennessee, Virginia, those kind of places. And I really wasn't hearing anything back from some of the churches that I'd sent in. And I'm like, okay, well. Um, and so a couple months go by, and I meet with the associate pastor at the time, thinking that we're getting ready to finally talk about, okay, what's the plan for the next, you know, six months of teaching the teens? And he goes, hey, he's like, I'm, I'm getting ready to leave Scranton. I'm taking a position at a, a church in another part of the city. Um, but I think you might be a good fit here as associate. And he said, so I'm just giving you a heads up so that you're, you know, as you're thinking through your decisions. Were you just blown away by that? Yeah, and I was like, okay, well, I hadn't thought about that. And <laughs> I was I'm thinking like, about leaving the state. Right, so I'm like, okay, and um, and I met with Pastor Joe, and, and we we talked some, and um, and there was a couple other guys that were kind of talking through those the the open position, and they posted an associate pastor's position that I applied for and went through the process and got hired. And um, through the course of that, the, as the associate pastor, some of my roles were different from the past associate pastor. And um, I was preaching a little bit more than I would expect as an associate pastor. And some of the other roles that I had, I felt like, were maybe a little more than, than normal. And, um, and after a few months, uh, Pastor Joe asked me if, if, if I would ever be interested in being a senior pastor there. Because he was thinking about retiring. Yeah, he'd actually already had those conversations with the elders. And he was saying, hey, we need to be thinking about a transition because I'm, I'm ready to, be, um, to not be senior pastor. And, um, and he, he's like, I don't know what that looks like, but let's, let's start having that conversation. So when I was hired, that was in the back of the mind of the elders and of Pastor Joe, but not not verbalize just because if it if I wasn't the right person it would be kind of awkward you know right yeah and so they after over a period of months uh, some of the responsibilities I had were kind of seeing how I would handle some of those things marriages we, I did a funeral those kinds of things preaching pretty regularly and um, and so after after that time they asked if I wanted to apply for that position as a kind of the transition and it's of course dependent upon the congregational vote and those kinds of things but we started to make that plan out. And honestly, I think we're still in that plan because I'm, I've been a senior pastor f- almost five years and Pastor Joe is part-time associate pastor. And and so the transition has been a, a long road that I think has been really good. Um, he and I have a really good relationship. We meet every week and we are, I, I like to think we're very honest with each other. And I don't think it can happen apart from that. And he's a he's very humble. And so like, our conversations are not always easy, but they're really good. And um, it's, it's you know, he texts me every Sunday. He texts me. And I was just looking back through those texts this morning. But he texts me. I, I could read you every Sunday text. Um, but I preached on the atonement last week. And he said, thank you. He said, the atonement. Thank you, Jesus. Fill my brother. Use him mightily. And the week before that, praying for love and clarity, power through Christ for his glory. Like every Sunday morning, he texts me at 6 o'clock just to, for encouragement and and I hear stories of those kinds of transitions that that's not happening. Oh, I mean the a, a five year transition is unheard of. Yeah, I I've heard of some pastors doing like an extended year. Yeah. Um. So it seems like you don't mind it. No, I, I love it. He he tells me he's like, hey, he's like, anytime you need me gone, just tell me. And I'm like, who else? Who says that kind of stuff? And <laughs> and uh and I love having him around. Like he's. He is like a mentor, so it's like I learn from him. I watch him when he's doing things, when he's meeting with people. He's got the, and I hope he's not listening because he he hates when I build him up like this, but he's got the highest capacity as a pastor I've ever met. Like his ability to love people and care for people is enormous. And and that's not my natural wiring, but I can watch him and learn. And he can push me in areas that I probably should be a little bit more uh, driven by mercy and love. And so those kinds of things are really good for he and I, but it's good for the church because, you know, if, if we're in good shape, then the church is going to be, hopefully be in good shape. And so, um, if it, if it builds up our leadership, then the, then the church will be benefiting from that. And that's been the, that's been my experience so far. Now, I, I would wonder whether the, the congregation is like, it's like playing ping pong, like who's in charge here? <laughs> is there, is there part of you, is there complexity in that and then it, knowing who's in charge? Yeah, it is complex because, you know, people have, for 30 years have called Pastor Joe when right. something happens. And he, he encourages them to call Pastor Mark and, and talk to Pastor Mark. And he, he removes himself from a lot of things, which is a hard thing to do, um, yeah. especially when he's used to that. And 
Um, but he he does it well. I, there's maybe been a couple of rubs, but we have those conversations. We talk about it, and I think it I think it's it's working out pretty good. So yeah, um, I I had prayed for years for a man like Pastor Joe in my life that I could learn from and that um, that I could follow kind of as a mentor. And so when I first started at Scranton, I'm like, I think this is the Lord's answer to my prayers. And um, and I hope that I'm as as helpful for him as he is for me. So um, Yeah, and I'm I'm just kind of struck in, in your story. So often people are straining to find, you know, God's call for them and they're straining for the thing they yeah, want. Yeah. I mean, was there a time when you, because it sounds like almost God just pulled you places. Yeah. Were you just open? You're yeah. like, God, just take me wherever, and that yeah. allowed you to bounce around? So when, 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 I, when me and my buddy got baptized, one of the kind of vows we made is, like, no matter where Jesus calls us, we're going to do it. And, like, I didn't know what that meant at the time, but it was kind of like a, a, like a dude thing. Like, we're going to form this bond. And we're going to do this. Like, if he calls us to go somewhere crazy, we're going to go there. And that was the conversation I was having with him because he was feeling like the Lord was calling him to the mission field. Yeah. And I'm like, no, don't leave me. But he was like, like, it was like that kind of thing. And he was, I mean, he was the brother to me. And so um, each and every step, if we felt, and my wife's with this, with me on this, if we felt the Lord is calling somewhere, like, that's where we, that's what we do. I mean, we do the discernment and figure out, like, is this a smart move? Those kinds of things. Um, especially, like, with church planning, we're like, we're not church planters and, and we went through a discernment process. We asked people and all the things that you're supposed to do. And everything kept pointing in that direction. And so when the church plant failed, we're like, like, what do we what do? What is this? Yeah. yeah. And so we kind of entered a holding pattern. We had promised my oldest son at the time he was a high schooler. He was a senior in high school. And we're like, no matter what, this year, we're going to let you finish high school before we move. Because he thought, all right, ministry's going to move us away. And so we spent that year, and so it gave us a year to pray and discern and try to figure it out and heal, because I was really tired. My wife was really tired. Oh, it's exhausting um, to plan a church. It's and taxing. It is very much It's very Can much so. Can you scoot this way just a yeah, little bit too? Very much sure so. Sorry. I'm, no, no, you're good. And, um, and so, like, through the course of that, trying to figure out, okay, where is the where is Lord want us at now? And, and try to just, like, walk in it. And it often has been felt like, like it's whatever door is open is the one we walk through. Well, and the, the, the part that gets me, and I mean, it's awkward for some, but I think it's just a reality. Police officers and law enforcement are not necessarily welcome in urban environments. Yeah. They're not, like, they're, they're loved in more rural mm -hmm. environments and celebrated, yeah. but not so much in an urban environment. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, that's got to be, is there tension in that for you? Or how, how, how is that something that works for you? You're not worried about people finding out he's a cop, you know? Well, it's it's because, you know, I don't look like a cop now, so uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't work out like I used to and uh, and I grew a beard and all that stuff. But um, uh, it's it, it's it's interesting in the conversations, but it also helps me. I see I see in certain things, I see like both perspectives and I understand both perspectives in a way probably not many people do. Yeah. And because I live, you know, I live right beside the church. So I, I live down the street from the church. My wife and Sorry. I are very, like, like we find it very important that we live in the community that we're trying to minister in. And so we live there. We like, you know, we're, we're, our life is there is urban. And, and yet we have these backgrounds that we can draw from to, to help understand different aspects of it. One thing I know is, um, people ask me all the time, like, how, was it hard leaving the police department? And I'm like, yeah, because it's a it's a whole culture in oh, yeah. itself. My wife was a police officer for a number of years. That's cool. My yeah. my, my father in law retired as a captain. Yeah, um, it's a it's its own cultural it's, it's, group. There's a camaraderie. Yeah. There's an understanding of life. Yeah, it's and that was hard. hard. To, it's hard to leave, but it's also like, um, th there's a there's a mission embedded in being a police. Like, it's an important thing, and um the thing that gives me hope and helped me leave is I knew so many men and women who love the Lord that are doing that job that are still doing that job. And it's a hard job. And, and so like that gave me hope. And I know like whenever you see the headlines, because the headlines are what they are, like there are still men and women who are in the trenches trying to do what's right and do, That's right. The, do the right thing in those jobs. And so I understand that aspect. But I also understand there's maybe some ugliness in there too sometimes. And then in the, where we live now, there's, it, it's people and people are, are the same everywhere. It's just like, how are they shaped? 
and um, and to try to love people well wherever we are. And um, sometimes I find that um, it can be challenging. If but I'm so far removed from that too. They're like, oh, like it's kind of a cool thing sometimes. Yeah, and, yeah. For my for my wife, it feels like it was just a different. Not a different life. That's a wrong. Yeah. I don't mean that theologically. Yeah. But it, she's just like it's so, it's so different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see huge value in that. And yeah. Honestly, I think somebody will be encouraged today, uh, by really some of the, one of the best ways to find God's calling for you is just to let go. Yeah. And just be open to where He sends you, even if it doesn't make sense. Right. And and read His Word. So here the so during that per- process, like in that year, I'm reading and the, God's Word shaped me as I deal with anger and hatred. But it's also, I began to read uh, Jesus' call to his disciples in Matthew 4. And, and like, when I'm reading those words, they're like, they are like, I've read them a hundred times, a thousand times. But at, in that year, they're grabbing me and they're like, like, is this, like, am I supposed to be dropping my fishing net? Like, there's a way that the Spirit is working through his word to, to, to grab me. And I'm reading that passage over and over again. And at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm reading through the Gospel of John. And John 8, John 8, 12 is one of my, like, verses where Jesus says he's the light of the world and that if anyone follows him they'll never walk in darkness and so I I arrested a guy once while I'm like studying that passage and the guy's like he had warrants for he was uh, possession with intent to distribute and really weird because the state police in Virginia at the time I don't know if they do now but we didn't have cages in the back of our car We, we transported our prisoners in the front passenger seat and so it's like you put them in the pasture seat and then you'd be sitting beside them for where we where I was at. It was a 40-minute drive to the where we process them in the jail. And so I would talk to these guys, especially as I was getting on fire for the Lord because I was trying to figure out ways to, like, uh, evangelize without, like, stepping over boundaries or anything like that, you know. But, uh, but I'm talking to this dude, and he's, like, super friendly and talking with me. And we're talking. It's just like we're driving to, you know, a game or something. We're talking. And at one point in the conversation, he goes, he's like, I've I've got all these dreams, and but no matter what I do, whatever steps I take, I always end up in the same place I've I've always been, in a police car. And he's like, and it's like I'm trapped in darkness and can't find my way out. And I'm like, and I've just been reading eight, John eight twelve, and I'm like, dude, like, Jesus. And uh, of course he's looking at me like crazy, but um, but that those kind of things were happening at the same time as I was like feeling like this, this um. I loved what I was doing. I was a firearms instructor. I was on our SWAT team. Those are all kind of like were dream jobs for me. You were way in. And I was like, yeah. and I was loving what I was doing, but at the same time, the Lord was like stirring a discontent in me that um, was pretty powerful. And um, yeah, so, at, you know, I was getting more involved in church, helping at the church and teaching and things like that. And I was just feeling like that was where I was supposed to. The first time I preached, I never get this. A buddy of mine, I said, hey, man, I need your critique on this preaching. So the first time the church gave me a chance to preach, they knew what I was thinking about doing, so they gave me a chance to preach. And I'm like, please tell me. He, he had gone to seminary. He was not in the pastor anymore. He was working for the State Department. Um, and so I'm like, I need your critique. So I'm preaching. At the end of my sermon, he gets up and leaves. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Was that bad? So I called him later that afternoon. I'm like, like, hey man, did, was it like, did you leave because it's so bad? And he's like, listen, he said, the preach, he said, your sermon was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, that's not why I left. He said, as you were preaching, the spirit was stirring something in me. And I was feeling like I needed to be more responsive to the Lord. And he's like, and that's the key. He's like, the, he, the key takeaway is it's never you. It's always God working through this. It's always his word that's working and stirring. And if you remember that, he's like, you are going to be a great preacher. And um, and he didn't mean that in the great like you know a, a national yeah, yeah. you know but that you would understand like what preaching is and if it if it opens God's word to the people then God's going to do the work and it's going to drive people to places where you'll never expect that and so that was probably one of the best advice that I ever got on preaching um, and you know I've got a ton of good advice on preaching so well and that that's why Pastor Mark Pratt um, ended up at Scranton Road Bible Church in Cleveland. Um, special thanks to all of you who stuck with us a little bit longer. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for staying a little bit yeah, longer. Yeah. I hope you come back and visit again soon. Yeah. It's a story only God can write. A farm <laughs> kid from Virginia would become a Marine, then a cop, and then a pastor in Cleveland. Yeah. Only God can write those stories. 
God bless you, my friend. Thank you so much. Again, the church yeah. website is? www.scrantonroad.org. Scrantonroad.org. All right. You can watch this again and share it with friends. Otherwise, tune in tomorrow, 6 to 9 a.m., uh, right here.